I shouted. Nothing happened. Next to me, pressed against the wall of the old fort, Annabeth peered into the rain, waiting for magical teenagers to fall out of the sky. Are you doing it right? She asked me. Gee, I dunno. I'm pretty sure his name is pronounced Carter. Try tapping the hieroglyph multiple times. That's stupid. Just try it. I stared at my hand. There wasn't even a trace of the hieroglyph that Carter Kane had drawn on my palm almost two months back. He'd assured me that the magic couldn't be washed away, but with my luck, I'd accidentally wiped it off on my pants or something. I tapped my palm. Carter. Hello, Carter. Percy to Carter. Paging Carter Kane. Testing. One, two, three. Is this thing on? Still nothing. Usually I wouldn't panic if the cavalry failed to show. Annabeth and I had been in a lot of bad situations without any backup. But usually we weren't stranded on Governor's Island in the middle of a hurricane, surrounded by fire-breathing death snakes. Actually, I have been surrounded by fire-breathing death snakes before, but not ones with wings. Everything is worse when it has wings. All right. Annabeth wiped the rain out of her eyes, which didn't help, since it was pouring buckets. Sadie's not answering her phone. Carter's hieroglyph isn't working. I guess we have to do this ourselves. Sure, I said. But what do we do? I peeked around the corner. At the far end of an arched entryway, a grass courtyard stretched about a hundred yards square, surrounded by red brick buildings. Annabeth had told me this place was a fort or something from the Revolutionary War, but I hadn't listened to the details. Our main problem was the guy standing in the middle of the lawn doing a magic ritual. He looked like a runty Elvis Presley, strutting back and forth in skinny black jeans, a powder blue dress shirt, and a black leather jacket. His greasy pompadour hairdo seemed impervious to the rain and the wind. In his hands he held an old scroll, like a treasure map. As he paced, he read aloud from it, occasionally throwing back his head and laughing. Basically the dude was in full-on crazy mode. If that wasn't creepy enough, flying around him were half a dozen winged serpents, blowing flames in the rain. Overhead, lightning flashed. Thunder shook my molars. Annabeth pulled me back. That's got to be Sedna, she said. The scroll he's reading from is the Book of Thoth. Whatever spell he's casting, we have to stop him. At this point I should probably back up and explain what the heck was going on. Only problem. I wasn't sure what the heck was going on. A couple of months ago, I fought this giant crocodile on Long Island. A kid named Carter Kane showed up, said he was a magician, and proceeded to help me by blowing up stuff with hieroglyphs and turning into a giant glowing chicken-headed warrior. Together we defeated the crocodile, which Carter explained was a son of Sobek, the Egyptian crocodile god. Carter postulated that some strange Egyptian-Greek hybrid stuff was happening. Gee, I never would have guessed. He wrote a magical hieroglyph on my hand and told me to call his name if I ever needed help. Fast forward to last month, Annabeth ran into Carter's sister, Sadie Kane, on the A train to Rockaway. They fought some godly dude named Serapis, who had a three-headed staff, and a cereal bowl for a hat. Afterward, Sadie told Annabeth that an ancient magician named Sedna might be behind all the weirdness. Apparently this Sedna had come back from the dead, snagged an ultra-powerful sorcery cheat sheet called the Book of Thoth, and was playing around with Egyptian and Greek magic, hoping to find a way to become a god himself. Sadie and Annabeth had exchanged numbers and agreed to keep in touch. Today, four weeks later, Annabeth showed up at my apartment at 10 in the morning and announced that she'd had a bad dream, a vision from her mom. By the way, her mom is Athena, the goddess of wisdom. My dad is Poseidon. We're Greek demigods. Just thought I should mention that, you know, in passing. Annabeth decided that instead of going to the movies, we should spend our Saturday slogging down to the bottom of Manhattan and taking the ferry to Governor's Island, where Athena had told her that trouble was brewing. 
As soon as we got there, a freak hurricane slammed into New York Harbor. All the mortals evacuated Governor's Island, leaving Annabeth and me stranded at an old fort with Crazy Elvis and the Flying Death Snakes. Make sense to you? Me neither. Your invisibility cap, I said. It's working again, right? How about I distract Sedna while you sneak up behind him? You can knock the book out of his hands. Annabeth knit her eyebrows. Even with her blonde hair plastered to the side of her face, she looked cute. Her eyes were the same color as the storm clouds. Sedna is supposedly the world's greatest magician, she said. He might be able to see through invisibility. Plus, if you run out there, he'll probably zap you with a spell. Believe me, Egyptian magic is not something you want to get zapped with. I know. Carter walloped me with a glowing blue fist once. But unless you have a better idea. Unfortunately, she didn't offer one. She pulled her New York Yankees cap from her backpack. Give me a minute head start. Try to take out those flying snakes first. They should be softer targets. Got it. I raised my ballpoint pen, which doesn't sound like an impressive weapon. But it turns into a magic sword when I uncap it. No, seriously. Will a celestial bronze blade kill them? Annabeth frowned. It should. At least, my bronze dagger worked on the staff of Serapis. Of course, that bronze dagger was made from an Egyptian wand, so, I'm getting a headache. Usually when I get a headache, it's time to stop talking and attack something. Fine. Just remember. Our main goal is to get that scroll. According to Sadie, Sedna can use it to turn himself immortal. Understood. No bad guys turning immortal on my watch. I kissed her, because one, when you're a demigod going into battle, every kiss might be your last, and two, I like kissing her. Be careful. She put on her Yankees cap and vanished. I'd love to tell you that I walked in and killed the snakes, Annabeth stabbed Elvis in the back and took his scroll, and we went home happy. You'd figure once in a while things would work out the way we planned. But no. I gave Annabeth a few seconds to sneak into the courtyard. Then I uncapped my pen, and Riptide sprang to full length, three feet of razor-sharp celestial bronze. I strolled into the courtyard and sliced the nearest serpent out of the air. Nothing says hi, neighbor. Like killing a guy's flying reptile. The snake didn't disintegrate like most monsters I'd fought. Its two halves just landed in the wet grass. The half with wings flopped around aimlessly. Crazy Elvis didn't notice. He kept pacing back and forth, engrossed in his scroll, so I moved farther into the courtyard and sliced another snake. The storm made it hard to see. Normally I can stay dry when submersed in water, but rain is trickier. It needled my skin and got in my eyes. Lightning flashed. By the time my vision cleared, two more snakes were dive-bombing me from either side. I jumped backward just as they blew fire. FYI, jumping backward is hard when you're holding a sword. It's even harder when the ground is muddy. Long story short, I slipped and landed on my butt. Flames shot over my head. The two snakes circled above me like they were too surprised to attack again. Probably they were wondering, did that guy just fall on his butt on purpose? Should we laugh before we kill him? Would that be mean? Before they could decide what to do, Crazy Elvis called out, leave him. The snakes darted off to join their brethren, who were orbiting 10 feet above the magician. I wanted to get up and face Sedna, but my rear end had other ideas. It wanted to stay where it was and be in extreme pain. Butts are like that sometimes. They can be, well, butts. Sedna rolled up his scroll. He sauntered toward me, the rain parting around him like a bead curtain. His winged snakes followed, their flames making plumes of steam in the storm. Hi, there. Sedna sounded so casual and friendly, I knew I was in trouble. You're a demigod, I suppose. I wondered how Sedna knew that. Maybe he could smell a demigod's aura the way Greek monsters could. 
or maybe my prankster friends the Stoll brothers had written I'm a demigod on my forehead in permanent marker, and Annabeth had decided not to tell me. That happened occasionally. Sedna's smile made his face look even gaunter. Dark eyeliner rimmed his eyes, giving him a hungry, feral stare. Around his neck glittered a golden chain of interlocking onks, and from his left ear dangled an ornament that looked like a human finger bone. You must be Sedna. I managed to get to my feet without killing myself. Did you get that outfit at the Halloween store? Sedna chuckled. Look, nothing personal, but I'm a little busy at the moment. I'm going to ask you and your girlfriend to wait while I finish my incantation, okay? Once I've summoned the Deshret, we can chat. I tried to look confused, which is one of my most convincing expressions. What girlfriend? I'm alone. Also, why are you summoning a Dishrag? It's Deshret. Sedna patted his pompadour. The red crown of Lower Egypt. As for your girlfriend, he wheeled and pointed behind him, shouting something like, Sana. Red hieroglyphs burned in the air where Sedna pointed, Annabeth turned visible. I'd never actually seen her wearing her Yankees cap before, since she vanished every time she put it on, but there she was, wide-eyed with surprise, caught in the act of sneaking up on Sedna. Before she could react, the red glowing hieroglyphs turned into ropes like licorice whips and lashed out, wrapping around her, pinning her arms and legs with such force that she toppled over. Hey! I yelled. Let her go! The magician grinned. Invisibility magic. Please. I've been using invisibility spells since the pyramids were under warranty. Like I said, this is nothing personal, demigods. I just can't spare the energy to kill you, at least not until the summons is over. I hope you understand. My heart hammered. I'd seen Egyptian magic before, when Carter helped me fight the giant crocodile on Long Island, but I had no idea how to stop it, and I couldn't stand to see it used against Annabeth. I charged at Sedna. He just waved his hand and muttered, who I? More stupid hieroglyphs flashed in front of me. I fell on my face. My face did not appreciate that. I got mud in my nostrils and blood in my mouth from biting my tongue. When I blinked, the red hieroglyphs burned on the insides of my eyelids. I groaned. What was that spell? Fall, Sedna said. One of my favorites. Really, don't get up. You'll just hurt yourself more. Sedna. Annabeth shouted through the storm. Listen to me. You can't make yourself into a god. It won't work. You'll just destroy. The coil of magical red ropes expanded, covering Annabeth's mouth. I appreciate your concern, said the magician. Really, I do. But I've got this figured out. That business with Serapis, when you destroyed my hybrid god. I learned quite a bit from that. I took excellent notes. Annabeth struggled uselessly. I wanted to run to her, but I had a feeling I'd just end up with my face in the mud again. I'd have to play this smart, which was not my usual style. I tried to steady my breathing. I scooted sideways, just to see if I could. So you were watching in Rockaway Beach? I asked Sedna. When Annabeth and Sadie took down Serapis, that was all an experiment to you. Of course. Sedna looked very pleased with himself. I jotted down the incantation Serapis used while he tried to raise his new Alexandrian lighthouse. Then it was just a matter of cross-referencing those with the older magic in the Book of Thoth, and voila. I found exactly the spell combo I need to make myself into a god. It's going to be great. Watch and see. He opened his scroll and started chanting again. His winged serpent spiraled through the rain. Lightning flashed. The ground rumbled. On Sedna's left, about 15 feet away from me, the grass split open. A geyser of flame spewed upward, and the winged serpents flew straight into it. Earth, fire, rain, and serpents swirled into a tornado of elements, merging and solidifying into one huge shape, a coiled cobra with a female human head. Her reptilian hood was easily six feet across. Her eyes glittered like rubies. 
A forked tongue flickered between her lips, and her dark hair was plated with gold. Resting on her head was a sort of crown, a red pillbox-looking thing with a curlicue ornament on the front. Now, personally, I'm not fond of huge snakes, especially ones with human heads and stupid hats. If I'd summoned this thing, I would have cast a spell to send it back, super quick. But Sedna just rolled up his scroll, slipped it in his jacket pocket, and grinned. Awesome. The cobra lady hissed. Who dares summon me? I am Wadjet, queen of cobras, protector of lower Egypt, eternal mistress of, I know. Sedna clapped his hands. I'm a huge fan. I crawled toward Annabeth. Not that I could help much with the fall spell keeping me off my feet, but I wanted to be close to her if something went down with this eternal cobra queen of whatever blah, blah, blah. Maybe I could at least use Riptide to cut those red cords and give Annabeth a fighting chance. Oh, this is so great, Sedna continued. He fished something out of his pants pocket, a cell phone. The goddess bared her fangs. She sprayed Sedna with a cloud of green mist, poison, I guessed, but he repelled it like the nose cone of a rocket repelled heat. I kept crawling toward Annabeth, who was struggling helplessly in her red licorice cocoon. Her eyes blazed with frustration. She hated being sidelined worse than just about anything. Okay, where's the camera icon? Sedna fumbled with his phone. We have to get a picture together before I destroy you. Destroy me, demanded the cobra goddess. She lashed out at Sedna, but a sudden gust of rain and wind pushed her back. I was ten feet away from Annabeth. Riptide's blade glowed as I dragged it through the mud. Let's see. Sedna tapped his phone. Sorry, this is new to me. I'm from the 19th dynasty. Ah, okay. No. Darn it. Where did the screen go? Ah, right. So what do modern folks call this, a snappy? He leaned in toward the cobra goddess, held out his phone at arm's length, and took a picture. Got it. What is the meaning of this? Wadjet roared. You dare take a selfie with the cobra goddess? Selfie. Said the magician. That's right. Thanks. And now I'll take your crown and consume your essence. Hope you don't mind. What? The cobra goddess reared and bared her fangs again, but the rain and wind restrained her like a seat belt. Sedna shouted something in a mixture of Egyptian and ancient Greek. A few of the Greek words I understood. Soul and bind and possibly butter, though I could be wrong about the last one. The cobra goddess began to writhe. I reached Annabeth just as Sedna finished his spell. The cobra goddess imploded, with a noise like the world's largest straw finishing the world's largest milkshake. Wadjet was sucked into her own red crown, along with Sedna's four winged serpents in a five foot wide circle of lawn where Wadjet had been coiled. The crown dropped into the smoking, muddy crater. Sedna laughed in delight. Perfect. I had to agree, if by perfect he meant so horrifying I want to vomit and I have to get Annabeth out of here right now. Sedna clambered into the pit to retrieve the crown as I frantically started cutting Annabeth's bonds. I'd only managed to ungag her mouth before the bindings blared like an air horn. My ears popped. My vision went black. When the sound died and my vertigo faded, Sedna was standing over us, the red crown now atop his pompadour. The ropes scream if you cut them, he advised. I guess I should have mentioned that. Annabeth wriggled, trying to free her hands. What? What did you do to the cobra goddess? Hmm. Oh. Sedna tapped the curlicue at the front of the crown. I devoured her essence. Now I have the power of lower Egypt. You devoured a god, I said. Yep. From his jacket, he pulled the book of Thoth and wagged it at us. Amazing what kind of knowledge is in here. Ptolemy the first had the right idea, making himself a god, but by the time he became king of Alexandria, Egyptian magic was diluted and weak. He definitely didn't have access to prime source material like the book of Thoth. With this baby, I'm cooking with spice. Now that I've got the crown of Lower Egypt, let me guess, Annabeth said. 
You'll go for the crown of Upper Egypt. Then you'll put them together and rule the world. He grinned. Smart girl. But first I have to destroy you too. Nothing personal. It's just that when you're doing hybrid Greek-Egyptian magic, I've found that a little demigod blood is a great catalyst. Now, if you'll just hold still, I lunged forward and jabbed him with my sword. Amazingly, Riptide went straight into his gut. I so rarely succeed that I just crouched there, stunned, my hand trembling on the hilt. Wow. Sedna looked down at the blood on his powder blue shirt. Nice job. Thanks. I tried to yank out Riptide, but it seemed to be stuck. So, you can die now, if it's not too much trouble. Sedna smiled apologetically. About that, I'm beyond dying now. At this point, he tapped the blade. Get it? This point. I'm afraid all you can do is make me stronger. His red crown began to glow. For once, my instincts saved my life. Despite the klutz spell Sedna had hexed me with, I somehow managed to get to my feet, grab Annabeth, and haul her as far from the magician as possible. I dropped to the ground at the archway as a massive roar shook the courtyard. Trees were uprooted. Windows shattered. Bricks peeled off the wall, and everything in sight hurtled toward Sedna as if he'd become the new center of gravity. Even Annabeth's magical bonds were stripped away. It took all my strength to hold her with one arm while gripping the corner of the building with my other hand. Clouds of debris spun around the magician. Wood, stone, and glass vaporized as they were absorbed into Sedna's body. Once gravity returned to normal, I realized I'd left something important behind. Riptide was gone. The wound in Sedna's gut had closed. Hey. I got up, my legs shaking. You ate my sword. My voice sounded shrill, like a little kid who's just had his lunch money stolen. The thing is, Riptide was my most important possession. I'd had it a long time. It had seen me through a lot of scrapes. I'd lost my sword before on a few occasions, but it always reappeared in pen form back in my pocket. I had a feeling that wasn't going to happen this time. Riptide had been consumed, sucked into Sedna's body along with the bricks, the broken glass, and several cubic feet of sod. Sedna turned up his palms. Sorry about that. I'm a growing deity. I need my nutrition. He tilted his head as if listening to something in the storm. Percy Jackson. Interesting. And your friend, Annabeth Chase. You two have had some interesting adventures. You'll give me lots of nourishment. Annabeth struggled to her feet. How do you know our names? Oh, you can learn a lot about someone from devouring their prized possession. Sedna patted his stomach. Now, if you don't mind, I really need to consume you both. Not to worry, though. Your essence will live forever right here, next to my, uh, pancreas, I think. I slipped my hand into Annabeth's. After all we'd been through, I was not going to let our lives end this way, devoured by a wannabe Elvis god with a pillbox hat. I weighed my options, direct attack or strategic retreat. I wanted to punch Sedna in his heavily mascarid eyes, but if I could get Annabeth to the shore, we could jump into the harbor. Being the son of Poseidon, I'd have the upper hand underwater. We could regroup, maybe come back with a few dozen demigod friends and some heavy artillery. Before I could decide, something completely random changed the equation. A full-sized camel dropped out of the sky and crushed Sedna flat. Sadie. Annabeth cried. For a split second, I thought she was calling the camel Sadie. Then I realized Annabeth was looking up into the storm, where two falcons spiraled above the courtyard. The camel bellowed and farted, which made me appreciate it even more. Unfortunately we didn't have time to become friends. The camel widened its eyes, bleated in alarm, and dissolved into sand. Sedna rose from the dust pile. His crown was tilted. His black jacket was covered in camel fuzz, but he looked unhurt. That was rude. He glanced up at the two falcons now diving toward him. No time for this nonsense. 
Just as the birds were about to rip his face off, Sedna vanished in a swirl of rain. The falcons landed and morphed into two human teens. On the right stood my buddy Carter Kane, looking casual in his beige linen combat jammies, with a curved ivory wand in one hand and a crescent-bladed sword in the other. On the left stood a slightly younger blonde girl, who I assumed was his sister, Sadie. She had black linen jammies, orange highlights in her hair, a white wooden staff, and mud-spattered combat boots. Physically, the two siblings looked nothing alike. Carter's complexion was coppery, his hair black and curly. His thoughtful scowl radiated seriousness. By contrast, Seedy was fair-skinned with blue eyes and a lopsided smile so full of mischief, I would have figured her for a Hermes kid back at Camp Halfblood. Then again, I have Cyclops and two-tailed merman as siblings. I wasn't about to comment on the Kane kid's lack of resemblance. Annabeth exhaled with relief. I am so glad to see you. She gave Sadie a big hug. Carter and I looked at each other. Hey, man, I said. I'm not going to hug you. That's okay, Carter said. Sorry we're late. This storm was messing up our locator magic. I nodded like I knew what locator magic was. So this friend of yours, Setna, he's kind of a dirt wipe. Sadie snorted. You don't know the half of it. Did he happen to give you a helpful villain monologue? Reveal his evil plans, say where he was going next, that sort of thing. Well, he used that scroll, the Book of Thoth, I said. He summoned a cobra goddess, devoured her essence, and stole her red hat. Oh, dear. Sadie glanced at Carter. The crown of Upper Egypt will be next. Carter nodded. And if he manages to put the two crowns together, he'll become a mortal, Annabeth guessed. A newly made god. Then he'll start vacuuming up all the Greek and Egyptian magic in the world. Also he stole my sword, I said. I want it back. The three of them stared at me. What? I said. I like my sword. Carter hooked his curvy bladed kopesh and his wand to his belt. Tell us everything that happened details. While we talked, Sadie muttered some sort of spell, and the rain bent around us like we were under a giant invisible umbrella. Neat trick. Annabeth had the better memory, so she did most of the explaining about our fight with Sedna, though calling it a fight was generous. When she was done, Carter knelt and traced some hieroglyphs in the mud. If Sedna gets the headjet, we're finished, he said. He'll form the crown of Ptolemy and, Hold up, I said. Low tolerance for confusing names. Can you explain what's going on in, like, regular words? Carter frowned. The P.S. Chent is the double crown of Egypt, okay. The bottom half is the red crown, the Deshret. It represents the lower kingdom. The top half is the headjet, the white crown of the upper kingdom. You wear them together, Annabeth added and that means you're the pharaoh of all Egypt. Except in this case, Sadie said, our ugly friend Sedna is creating a very special P.S. Chent, the crown of Ptolemy. Okay, I still didn't get it, but felt like I should at least pretend to follow along. But wasn't Ptolemy a Greek dude? Yes, Carter said. Alexander the Great conquered Egypt. Then he died. His general Ptolemy took over and tried to mix Greek and Egyptian religion. He proclaimed himself a god-king, like the old pharaohs, but Ptolemy went a step further. He used a combination of Greek and Egypt magic to try making himself a mortal. It didn't work out, but, Sedna has perfected the formula, I guessed. That book of Thoth gives him some primo magic. Sadie clapped for me. I think you've got it. Sedna will recreate the crown of Ptolemy, but this time he'll do it properly, and he'll become a god. Which is bad, I said. Annabeth tugged thoughtfully at her ear. So, who was that cobra goddess? Wadjet, Carter said. The guardian of the red crown. And there's a guardian of the white crown. She asked. Neckbet. Carter's expression turned sour. The vulture goddess. I don't like her much 
but I suppose we'll have to stop her from getting devoured. Since Setna needs the Upper Kingdom crown, he'll probably go south for the next ritual. It's like a symbolic thing. Isn't up usually north? I asked. Sadie smirked. Oh, that would be much too easy. In Egypt, up is south, because the Nile runs from the south to the north. Great, I said. So how far south are we talking about, Brooklyn? Antarctica. I don't think he'll go that far. Carter rose to his feet and scanned the horizon. Our headquarters are in Brooklyn. And I'm guessing Manhattan is like Greek God Central. A long time ago, our Uncle Amos hinted at that. Well, yeah, I said. Mount Olympus hovers over the Empire State Building, so, Mount Olympus, Sadie blinked, hovers over the, of course it does. Why not? I think what my brother's trying to say is that if Setna wants to establish a new seat of power, blending Greek and Egyptian, he'd find a place in between Brooklyn and Manhattan, Annabeth said. Like right here, Governor's Island. Exactly, Carter said. He'll need to conduct the ritual for the second crown south of this point, but it doesn't have to be far south. If I were him, and we're glad you're not, I said. I would stay on Governor's Island. We're at the north end now, so, I gazed south. Anyone know what's at the other end? I've never been here, Annabeth said. But I think there's a picnic area. Lovely. Sadie raised her staff. The tip flared with white fire. Anyone fancy a picnic in the rain? Setna's dangerous, Annabeth said. We can't just go charging in. We need a plan. She's right, Carter said. I kind of like charging in, I said. Speed is of the essence, right? Thank you, Sadie muttered. Being smart is also of the essence, Annabeth said. Exactly, Carter said. We have to figure out how to attack. Sadie rolled her eyes at me. Just as I feared. These two together, they'll overthink us to death. I felt the same way, but Annabeth was getting that annoyed stormy look in her eyes, and since I date Annabeth, I figured I'd better suggest a compromise. How about we plan while we walk? I said. We can charge south, like, really slowly. Deal, said Carter. We headed down the road from the old fort, past some fancy brick buildings that might have been offices quarters back in the day. We made our way across a soggy expanse of soccer fields. The rain kept pouring down, but Sadie's magic umbrella traveled with us, keeping the worst of the storm away. Annabeth and Carter compared notes from the research they'd done. They talked about Ptolemy and the mixing of Greek and Egyptian magic. As for Sadie, she didn't appear interested in strategy. She leapt from puddle to puddle in her combat boots. She hummed to herself, twirled like a little kid, and occasionally pulled random things out of her backpack, wax animal figurines, some string, a piece of chalk, a bright yellow bag of candy. She reminded me of someone. Then it occurred to me. She looked like a younger version of Annabeth, but her fidgeting and hyperness reminded me of, well, me. If Annabeth and I ever had a daughter, she might be a lot like Sadie. Whoa. It's not like I'd never dreamed about kids before. I mean, you date someone for over a year, the idea is going to be in the back of your mind somewhere, right? But still, I'm barely 17. I'm not ready to think too seriously about stuff like that. Also, I'm a demigod. On a day-to-day -day basis, I'm busy just trying to stay alive. Yet, looking at Sadie, I could imagine that someday maybe I'd have a little girl who looked like Annabeth and acted like me, a cute little hellion of a demigod, stomping through puddles and flattening monsters with magic camels. I must have been staring, because Sadie frowned at me. What? Nothing, I said quickly. Carter nudged me. Were you listening? Yes. No. What? Annabeth sighed. Percy, explaining things to you is like lecturing a gerbil. Hey, wise girl, don't start with me. Whatever, seaweed brain. We were just saying that we'll have to combine our attacks. Combine our attacks, I patted my pocket, 
but Riptide had not reappeared in pen form. I didn't want to admit how nervous that made me. Sure, I had other skills. I could make waves, literally, and occasionally even whip up a nice frothy hurricane. But my sword was a big part of who I was. Without it, I felt crippled. How do we do combine attacks? Carter got a mischievous gleam in his eyes that made him look more like his sister. We turned Setna's strategy against him. He's using hybrid magic, Greek and Egyptian together, right? We do the same. Annabeth nodded. Greek-style attacks won't work. You saw what Setna did with your sword. And Carter is pretty sure regular Egyptian spells won't be enough either. But if we can find a way to mix our powers, do you know how to mix our powers? I asked. Carter's shoes squished in the mud. Well, not exactly. Oh, please, Sadie said. That's easy. Carter, give your wand to Percy. Why? Just do it, brother dear. Annabeth, do you remember when we fought Serapis? Right. Annabeth's eyes lit up. I grabbed Sadie's wand and it turned into a celestial bronze dagger, just like my old one. It was able to destroy Serapis's staff. Maybe we can create another Greek weapon from an Egyptian wand. Good idea, Sadie. Cheers. You see, I don't need to spend hours planning and researching to be brilliant. Now, Carter, if you please. As soon as I took the wand, my hand clenched like I'd grabbed an electrical cable. Spikes of pain shot up my arm. I tried to drop the wand, but I couldn't. Tears filled my eyes. By the way, Sadie said, this may hurt a bit. Thanks. I gritted my teeth. Little late on the warning. The ivory began to smolder. When the smoke cleared and the agony subsided, instead of a wand I was holding a celestial bronze sword that definitely wasn't riptide. What is this? I asked. It's huge. Carter whistled under his breath. I've seen those in museums. That's a copus. I hefted the sword. Like so many I'd tried, it didn't feel right in my hands. The hilt was too heavy for my wrist. The single-edged blade was curved awkwardly, like a giant hook knife. I tried a jab and nearly lost my balance. This one doesn't look like yours, I told Carter. Isn't yours called a copus? Mine is a kopesh, Carter said. The original Egyptian version. What you're holding is a copus, a Greek design adapted from the Egyptian original. It's the kind of sword Ptolemy warriors would have used. I looked at Sadie. Is he trying to confuse me? No, she said brightly. He's confusing without trying. Carter smacked his palm against his forehead. That wasn't even confusing. How was that? Never mind. Percy, the main thing is, can you fight with that sword? I slice the copus through the air. I feel like I'm fencing with a meat cleaver, but it'll have to do. What about weapons for you guys? Annabeth rubbed the clay beads on her necklace, the way she does when she's thinking. She looked beautiful. But I digress. Sadie, she said, those hieroglyphic spells you used on Rockaway Beach, which one made the explosion? It's called, well, I can't actually say the word without making you blow up. Hold on. Sadie rummaged through her backpack. She brought out a sheet of yellow papyrus, a stylus, and a bottle of ink, I guess because pen and paper would be un-Egyptian. She knelt, using her backpack as a makeshift writing desk, and scrawled in normal letters, Hadi. That's a good spell, Carter agreed. We could show you the hieroglyph for it, but unless you know how to speak words of power, no need, Annabeth said. The phrase means explode. More or less, Sadie said. And you can write the hieroglyph on a scroll without triggering the ka boom. Right. The scroll will store the magic for later. If you read the word from the papyrus, well, that's even better. More ka boom with less effort. Good, Annabeth said. Do you have another piece of papyrus? Annabeth, I said, what are you doing? Because if you're messing around with exploding words, relax, she said. I know what I'm doing. Sort of. 
she knelt next to Sadie, who gave her a fresh sheet of papyrus. Annabeth took the stylus and wrote something in ancient Greek. Quran O Acute Omega. Being dyslexic, I'm lucky if I can recognize English words, but being a demigod, ancient Greek is sort of hardwired into my brain. K Rao No, I pronounced. Blast. Annabeth gave me a wicked little smile. Closest term I could think of. Literally it means strike with lightning bolts. Ooh, Sadie said. I love striking things with lightning bolts. Carter stared at the papyrus. You're thinking we could invoke an ancient Greek word the same way we do with hieroglyphs. It's worth a try, Annabeth said. Which of you is better with that kind of magic? Sadie, Carter said. I'm more a combat magician. Giant chicken mode, I remembered. Dude, my avatar is a falcon-headed warrior. I still think you could get a sponsorship deal with KFC. Make some big bucks. Knock it off, you too. Annabeth handed her scroll to Sadie. Carter, let's trade. I'll try your kopesh. You try my Yankees cap. She tossed him the hat. I'm usually more of a basketball guy, but, Carter put on the cap and disappeared. Wow, okay. I'm invisible, aren't I? Sadie applauded. You've never looked better, brother dear. Very funny. If you can sneak up on Sedna, Annabeth suggested, you might be able to take him by surprise, get the crown away from him. But you told us Sedna saw right through your invisibility, Carter said. That was me, Annabeth said, a Greek using a Greek magic item. For you, maybe it'll work better, or differently, at least. Carter, give it a shot, I said. The only thing better than a giant chicken man is a giant invisible chicken man. Suddenly the ground shook under our feet. Across the soccer fields, toward the south end of the island, a white glow lit the horizon. That can't be good, Annabeth said. No, Sadie agreed. Perhaps we should charge in a little more quickly. The vultures were having a party. Past a line of trees, a muddy field stretched to the edge of the island. At the base of a small lighthouse, a few picnic tables huddled as if for shelter. Across the harbor, the Statue of Liberty glowed white in the storm, rain clouds pushing around her like waves off the prow of a ship. In the middle of the picnic grounds, six large black buzzards whirled in the rain, orbiting our buddy Sedna. The magician was rocking a new outfit. He'd changed into a red quilted smoking jacket, I guess to match his red crown. His silk pants shimmered in red and black paisley. Just to make sure his look wasn't too understated, his loafers were entirely covered in rhinestones. He strutted around with the Book of Thoth, chanting some spell, the same way he'd done back at the fort. He's summoning Nekbet, Sadie murmured. I'd really rather not see her again. What kind of name is Nekbut, anyway? I asked. Sadie snickered. That's what I called her the first time I saw her. But really, she's not very nice. Possessed my gran, chased me across London, so what's the plan? Carter asked. Maybe a flanking maneuver? Or, Annabeth said, we could try a diversionary, charge. Sadie barreled into the clearing her staff in one hand and her Greek scroll in the other. I glanced at Annabeth. Your new friend is awesome. Then I followed Sadie. My plan was pretty simple. Run at Sedna and kill him. Even with my heavy new sword, I outpaced Sadie. Two vultures dived at me. I sliced them out of the air. I was five feet from Sedna and imagining the satisfaction of slicing him in half when he turned and noticed me. The magician vanished. My blade cut through empty air. I stumbled, off balance and angry. Ten feet to my left, Sidi smacked a vulture with her staff. The bird exploded into white sand. Annabeth jogged toward us, giving me one of those annoyed expressions like, if you get yourself killed, I'm going to murder you. Carter, being invisible, was nowhere to be seen. With a bolt of white fire, Sadie blasted another vulture out of the sky. The remaining birds scattered in the storm. Sadie scanned the field for Sedna. 
Where is the skinny old git? The skinny old git appeared right behind her. He spoke a single word from his scroll of nasty surprises, and the ground exploded. When I regained my senses, I was still standing, which was a minor miracle. The force of the spell had pushed me away from Sedna, so my shoes had made trenches in the mud. I looked up, but I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. Around Sedna, the earth had ruptured in a 10-foot diameter ring, splitting open like a sea pod. Plumes of dirt had sprayed outward and were frozen in midair. Tendrils of red sand coiled around my legs and brushed against my face as they snaked in all directions. It looked like somebody had stopped time while slinging red mud from a giant salad spinner. Sadie lay flat on the ground to my left, her legs buried under a blanket of mud. She struggled but couldn't seem to get free. Her staff was knocked out of reach. Her scroll was a muddy rag in her hand. I stepped toward her, but the coils of sand pushed me back. Somewhere behind me, Annabeth yelled my name. I turned and saw her just outside the explosion zone. She was trying to charge in, but the earthen tendrils moved to block her, whipping around like octopus arms. There was no sign of Carter. I could only hope he hadn't gotten caught in this stupid web of floating dirt. Setna. I yelled. The magician brushed the lapels of his smoking jacket. You really should stop interrupting me, demigod. The Deshret crown was originally a gift to the pharaohs from the earth god Jeb, you know. It can defend itself with some cool earth magic. I gritted my teeth. Annabeth and I had recently done battle with Gia the earth mother. More dirt sorcery was the last thing I needed. Sadie struggled, her legs still encased in mud. Clean up all this dirt right now, young man. Then give us that crown and go to your room. The magician's eyes glittered. Ah, Sadie. Delightful as always. Where's your brother? Did I accidentally blow him up? You can thank me for that later. Right now, I must get on with business. He turned his back on us and resumed chanting. The wind picked up. Rain whipped around him. The floating lines of sand began to stir and shift. I managed to step forward, but it was like wading through wet cement. Behind me, Annabeth wasn't having much more luck. Sadie managed to pull one of her legs free, minus her combat boot. She cursed worse than my immortal horse friend Arian, which is pretty bad, as she retrieved the boot. Sedna's weird earth spell was loosening, but not fast enough. I'd only managed two more steps when Sedna finished his incantation. In front of him, a wisp of darkness grew into the form of a queenly woman. Rubies embroidered the collar of her black dress. Gold bands circled her upper arms. Her face had an imperious, timeless quality that I'd learned to recognize. It meant I'm a goddess. Deal with it. Perched atop her braided black hair was a white conical crown, and I couldn't help wondering why a powerful immortal being would choose to wear a headpiece shaped like a bowling pin. You. She snarled at Sedna. Me. He agreed. Wonderful to see you again, Neckbet. Sorry we don't have longer to chat, but I can't keep these mortals pinned down forever. We'll have to make this brief. The headjet, please. The vulture goddess spread her arms, which grew into huge black wings. Around her, the air turned dark as smoke. I do not yield to upstarts like you. I am the protector of the crown, the shield of the pharaoh, the, yes, yes, Sedna said. But you've yielded to upstarts plenty of times. The history of Egypt is basically a list of which upstarts you've yielded to. So let's have the crown. I didn't know vultures could hiss, but Nekbet did. Smoke billowed from her wings. All around the clearing, Sedna's earth magic shattered. The tendrils of red sand fell to the ground with a loud slosh, and suddenly I could move again. Sadie struggled to her feet. Annabeth ran to my side. Sedna didn't seem concerned about us. He gave Nekbet a mock bow. Very impressive. But watch this. He didn't need to read from the scroll this time. He shouted a combination of Greek and Egyptian, words I recognized from the spell he'd used back at the fort. 
I locked eyes with Annabeth. I could tell we were thinking the same thing. We couldn't let Sedna consume the goddess. Sadie raised her muddy piece of papyrus. Annabeth, you and Percy get Neckbed out of here. Go. No time to argue. Annabeth and I plowed into the goddess-like linebackers and pushed her across the field, away from Sedna. Behind us, Sadie yelled, K Rao no. I didn't see the explosion, but it must have been impressive. Annabeth and I were thrown forward. We landed on top of Neckbet, who let out an indignant squawk. By the way, I would not recommend stuffing your pillow with vulture feathers. They're not very comfy. I managed to get up. Where Sedna had been standing was a smoking crater. Sadie's hair was singed at the tips. Her scroll was gone. Her eyes were wide with surprise. That was brilliant. Did I get him? Nope. Sedna appeared a few feet away, stumbling a little. His clothes were smoldering, but he looked more dazed than hurt. He knelt and picked up something conical and white, Neckbet's crown, which must have rolled off when we tackled her. Thanks for this. Sedna spread his arms triumphantly, the white crown in one hand, the Book of Thoth in the other. Now, where was I? Oh, right. Consuming all of you. Across the field, Carter's voice yelled, S-T-A-H-P. I guess stop is actually a word in ancient Egyptian. Who knew? A bright blue hieroglyph scythed through the air, cutting off Sedna's right hand at the wrist. Sedna shrieked in pain. The Book of Thoth dropped into the grass. Twenty feet away from me, Carter appeared out of thin air, holding Annabeth's Yankees cap. He wasn't in giant chicken mode, but since he'd just saved our lives, I wasn't going to complain. Sedna glanced down at the Book of Thoth, still in his severed hand, but I lunged forward, thrusting the point of my new sword under his nose. I don't think so. The magician snarled. Take the book, then. I don't need it anymore. He vanished in a whirl of darkness. On the ground behind me, the vulture goddess Neckbet thrashed and pushed Annabeth aside. Get off me. Hey, lady, Annabeth rose, I was trying to keep you from being devoured. You're welcome. The vulture goddess got to her feet. She didn't look nearly as impressive without her crown. Her hairdo was a mud and grass salad. Her black dress had turned into a smock of molting feathers. She looked shriveled and hunched over, with her neck sticking out like, well, a vulture. All she needed was a cardboard sign saying, homeless, anything helps, and I totally would have given her my spare change. You miserable children, she grumbled. I could have destroyed that magician. Not so much, I said. A few minutes ago, we watched Sedna inhale a cobra goddess. She was a lot more impressive than you. Neckbet's eyes narrowed. Wadjet. He inhaled Wadjet. Tell me everything. Carter and Sadie joined us as we briefed the goddess on what had happened so far. When we were done, Neckbet wailed in outrage. This is unacceptable. Wadjet and I were the symbols of unity in ancient Egypt. We were revered as the two ladies. That upstart Sedna has stolen my other lady. Well, he didn't get you, Sadie said. Which I suppose is a good thing. Neckbed bared her teeth, which were pointy and red like a row of little vulture beaks. You canes. I should have known you'd be involved. Always mucking about in godly affairs. Oh, so now it's our fault. Sadie hefted her staff. Listen here. Buzzard breath, let's stay focused, Carter said. At least we got the Book of Thoth. We stopped Sedna from devouring Neckbet. So what's Sedna's next move, and how do we stop him? He has both parts of the P.S. Chent, said the vulture goddess. Without my essence, the white crown is not as powerful as it would be, true, but it's still enough for Sedna's purposes. He needs only to complete the deification ceremony while wearing the crown of Ptolemy. Then he will become a god. I hate it when mortals become gods. They always want thrones. They build garish MC palaces. They don't respect the rules in the gods lounge. The gods lounge? I asked. 
We must stop him. Neckbed yelled. Sadie, Carter, Annabeth, and I exchanged uneasy looks. Normally when a god says we must stop him, it means you must stop him while I sit back and enjoy a cold beverage. But Neckbed seemed serious about joining the gang. That didn't make me any less nervous. I tried to avoid teaming up with goddesses who eat roadkill. It's one of my personal boundaries. Carter knelt. He pulled the Book of Thoth from Setna's severed hand. Can we use the scroll? It has powerful magic. If that's true, Annabeth said, why would Setna leave it behind? I thought it was the key to his immortality. He said he was done with it, I recalled. I guess he, like, passed the test, so he threw away his notes. Annabeth looked horrified. Are you crazy? You throw away your notes after a test. Doesn't everybody, Miss Brainiac? Guys. Sadie interrupted. It's terribly cute watching you two snipe at each other, but we have business. She turned to Neckbet. Now, your scavenging highness, is there a way to stop Sedna? Neckbet curled her talon fingernails. Possibly. He's not a full god yet. But without my crown, my own powers are greatly diminished. What about the Book of Thoth? Sadie asked. It may be no further use to Sedna, but it did help us defeat Apophis. At the mention of that name, Neckbet's face blanched. Three feathers fell from her dress. Please don't remind me of that battle. But you're correct. The Book of Thoth contains a spell for imprisoning gods. It would take a great deal of concentration and preparation. Carter coughed. I'm guessing Sedna won't stand around quietly while we get ready. No, Neckbed agreed. At least three of you would be required to set a proper trap. A circle must be drawn. A rope must be enchanted. The earth must be consecrated. Other parts of the spell would have to be improvised. I hate Ptolemaic magic. Mixing Greek and Egyptian power is an abomination. However, it works, Annabeth said. Carter was able to go invisible using my hat. Sadie's explosion scroll at least dazed Sedna. But we'll need more, Sadie said. Yes, the vulture goddess fixed her eyes on me like I was a tasty dead possum on the side of the highway. One of you will have to fight Sedna and keep him unbalanced while the others prepare the trap. We need a very potent hybrid attack, an abomination even Ptolemy would approve of. Why are you looking at me? I asked. I'm not abominable. You are a son of Poseidon, the goddess noted. That would be a most unexpected combination. Combination? What? Oh, no, no, no. Sadie raised her hands. She looked horrified, and anything that could scare that girl I did not want to know about. Neckbet, you can't be serious. You want a demigod to host you. He's not even a magician. He doesn't have the blood of the pharaohs. Carter grimaced. That's her point, Sadie. Percy isn't the usual kind of host. If the pairing worked, he could be very powerful. Or it could melt his brain. Sadie said. Hold it, Annabeth said. I prefer my boyfriend with an unmelted brain. What exactly are we talking about here? Carter wagged the Yankees cap at me. Neckbed wants Percy to be her host. That's one way the Egyptian gods maintain a presence in the mortal world. They can inhabit mortals' bodies. My stomach jackknifed. You want her, I pointed at the frazzled old vulture goddess, to inhabit me. That sounds, I tried to think of a word that would convey my complete disgust without offending the goddess. I failed. Neckbed. Annabeth stepped forward, join with me instead. I'm a child of Athena. I might be better, ridiculous. The goddess sneered. Your mind is too wily, girl, too stubborn and intelligent. I couldn't steer you as easily. Steer me. I protested. Hey, lady, I'm not a Toyota. My host needs a certain level of simplicity, the goddess continued. Percy Jackson is perfect. He is powerful, yet his mind is not overly crowded with plans and ideas. Wow, I said. Really feeling the love here. Neckbed rounded on me. There is no time to argue. 
Without a physical anchor, I cannot remain in the mortal world much longer. If you want to stop Sedna from becoming immortal, you need the power of a god. We must act now. Together, we will triumph. We will feast upon that upstart magician's carcass. I swallowed. I'm actually trying to cut back on carcass feasting. Carter gave me a sympathetic look that only made me feel worse. Unfortunately, Neckbed is right. Percy, you're our best shot. Sadie and I couldn't host Neckbed even if she wanted us to. We already have patron gods. Who, conveniently, have gone silent, Sadie noted. Scared of getting their essences sucked up, I suppose. Neckbed fixed her glittery black eyes on me. Do you consent to hosting me, demigod? I could think of a million ways to say no. The word yes simply wouldn't pass my lips. I glanced at Annabeth for support, but she looked as alarmed as I felt. I, I don't know, Percy, she confessed. This is way beyond me. Suddenly the rainstorm fizzled out. In the eerie muggy quiet, a red glow lit the middle of the island, as if somebody had started a bonfire on the soccer fields. That would be Sedna, Nekbet said. He has begun his ascension to godhood. What is your answer, Percy Jackson? This will only work properly if you consent. I took a deep breath. I told myself that hosting a goddess couldn't be worse than all the other weird horrible things I'd experienced in my demigod career. Besides, my friends needed my help. And I did not want that skinny Elvis impersonator to become a god and build a MC palace in my neighborhood. All right, I said. Vulture me up. Neckbet dissolved into black smoke. She swirled around me, filling my nostrils with a smell like boiling tar. What was it like merging with a god? If you want the full details, read my Yelp review. I don't feel like going into it again. I gave the experience half a star. For now, let's just say that being possessed by a vulture goddess was even more disturbing than I'd imagined. Thousands of years of memories flooded my mind. I saw pyramids rising from the desert, the sun glittering on the Nile River. I heard priests chanting in the cool shadows of a temple, and smelled myrrh incense on the air. I soared over the cities of ancient Egypt, circling the palace of the pharaoh. I was the vulture goddess Nekbet, protector of the king, shield of the strong, scourge of the weak and dying. I also had a burning desire to find a nice warm hyena carcass, stick my face right in there, and, okay, basically I wasn't myself. I tried to focus on the present. I stared at my shoes, the same old pair of brooks, yellow shoelace on the left, black shoelace on the right. I raised my sword arm to make sure I could still control my muscles. Relax, demigod. The voice of Nekbet spoke in my mind. Let me take charge. I don't think so, I said aloud. I was relieved that my voice still sounded like my voice. We do this together or not at all? Percy. Annabeth asked. Are you okay? Looking at her was disorienting. The, Percy, part of me saw my usual awesome girlfriend. The, Neckbet, part of me saw a young woman surrounded by a powerful ultraviolet aura, the mark of a Greek demigod. The sight filled me with disdain and fear. For the record, I have my own healthy fear of Annabeth. She has kicked my butt on more than one occasion. But disdain, not so much. That was all Neckbet. I'm fine, I said. I was talking to the vulture in my head. Carter walked a circle around me, frowning like I was an abstract sculpture. Percy, try to strike a balance. Don't let her take over but don't fight her, either. It's kind of like running a three-legged race. You have to get in a rhythm with your partner. But if you have to choose, Sadie said, smack her down and stay in control. I snarled. Stupid girl. Do not tell me, I forced my lips closed. The taste of rotting jackal filled my mouth. Sorry, Sadie, I managed. That was Neckbet talking, not me. I know. Sadie's expression tightened. I wish we had more time for you to get used to hosting a goddess. However, 
Another red flash illuminated the treetops. The sooner I get this goddess out of my head, the better, I said. Let's go smash Sedna's face. Sedna really could not decide on his wardrobe. He strutted around the soccer field in black bell-bottomed slacks, a frilly white shirt, and a glittery purple trench coat, all of which clashed with his newly combined red and white crown. He looked like Prince from one of my mom's old album covers, and judging from the magic lights swirling around him, Sedna was getting ready to party like it was 1999 BCE. Having only one hand didn't seem to bother him. He waved his stump conductor style, chanting in Greek and Egyptian while fog rose at his feet. Bursts of light danced and bobbed around him, as if a thousand kids were writing their names with sparklers. I didn't understand what I was looking at, but Nekbet did. Having her sight, I recognized the duat, the magical dimension that existed beneath the mortal realm. I saw layers of reality, like strata of glowing multicolored jelly, plunging down into infinity. On the surface, where the mortal and immortal worlds met, Sedna was whipping the duet into a storm, churning waves of color and frothy white plumes of smoke. After Annabeth's adventure on Rockaway Beach, she told me how frightening it was to see the duet. She wondered whether the Egyptian duet was somehow related to the Greek concept of mist, the magical veil that kept mortals from recognizing gods and monsters. With Nekbed in my mind, I knew the answer. Of course the mist was related. The mist was simply a Greek name for the uppermost layer between the worlds, the layer that Sedna was now shredding. I should have been terrified. Seeing the world in all its infinite levels was enough to give anybody vertigo. But I'd been dropped into oceans before. I was used to floating in the depths with endless thermal layers around me. Also, Nekbet wasn't easily impressed. She'd seen just about everything over the millennia. Her mind was as cold and dry as the desert night wind. To her, the mortal world was a constantly changing wasteland, dotted with the carcasses of men and their civilizations. Nothing lasted. It was all roadkill waiting to happen. As for the duet, it was always churning, sending up plumes of magic-like sun flares into the mortal world. Still, we were both disturbed by the way Sedna's spell tore through the mist. He wasn't just manipulating it. Magicians did that all the time. Sedna was strip mining the duet. Wherever he stepped, fractures radiated outward, cleaving through the layers of the magic realm. His body sucked in energy from every direction, destroying the boundaries between the duet and the mortal world, between Greek magic and Egyptian magic, slowly transforming him into an immortal. In the process, he was ripping a hole in the cosmic order that might never close. His magic pulled at us, Nekbed and me, urging us to give up and be absorbed into his new glorious form. I didn't want to be absorbed. Neither did the vulture goddess. Our common purpose helped us work together. I marched across the field. Sadie and Annabeth fanned out on my right. I assumed Carter was somewhere on my left, but he'd gone invisible again, so I couldn't be sure. The fact that I couldn't detect him, even with Nekbet's super vulture senses, gave me hope that Sedna wouldn't see him either. Maybe if I kept Sedna busy, Carter would be able to cut off Sedna's other hand. Or his legs. Bonus points for his head. Sedna stopped chanting when he saw me. Awesome. He grinned. You brought the vulture with you. Thanks. Not the reaction I'd been hoping for. I keep waiting for the day when the bad guy sees me and screams, I give up. But it hasn't happened yet. Sedna, drop the crown. I raised my copus, which didn't feel heavy with Nekbet's power flowing through me. Surrender, and you might get out of this alive. Otherwise, oh, very good. Very threatening. And your friends here, let me guess. You keep me occupied while they set some amazing trap to contain the newly made god. You're not a god yet. He waved off the comment. I suppose Carter is lurking around here too, all stealthy and invisible. Hi, Carter. If Carter was nearby, he didn't respond. Smart guy. 
Sedna raised his stump of a wrist. Wherever you are, Carter, I was impressed with the hand cutting off spell. Your father would be proud. That's what matters to you, isn't it? Making your father proud. But think what would be possible if you joined me. I intend to change the rules of the game. We could bring your father back to life, I mean real life, not that horrible half-life he's got in the underworld. Anything is possible, once I'm a god. Around Sedna's wrist, the mist curled, solidifying into a new hand. What do you say, Carter? Above the magician, the air shimmered. A giant blue fist the size of a refrigerator appeared over Sedna's head and pounded him into the ground like a nail into soft wood. I say no. Carter appeared across the field, Annabeth's Yankees cap in his hand. I stared at the crown of Ptolemy, the only part of Sedna still visible above ground. You were supposed to wait, I told Carter. Set the trap. Let me deal with Sedna. Carter shrugged. He shouldn't have brought up my father. Never mind that, Annabeth said. Get the crown. I realized she was right. I would have sprung into action, except Neckbed and I had a moment of paralysis. The goddess wanted her hat back. But I took one look at the crown's eerie glow, remembered the way the cobra goddess had been devoured, and decided I was not touching that crown without latex gloves and maybe a hazmat suit. Before Neckbed and I could resolve our differences, the earth rumbled. Sedna rose from the ground as if on an elevator platform and glared at Carter. I make you a perfectly fair offer, and you hit me with a giant fist. Perhaps your father wouldn't be proud, after all. Carter's face contorted. His whole body glowed with blue light. He levitated off the ground as the avatar of Horus took shape around him. Sedna didn't look worried. He curled his newly regrown fingers in a come-here gesture, and Carter's avatar shattered. The blue light swirled toward Sedna and was engulfed in his growing aura. Carter collapsed, motionless, on the wet ground. S-E-T-N-E. -E. Sadie shouted, raising her staff. Over here, you little weasel. She blasted the magician with a jet of white fire. Sedna caught it on his chest and absorbed the energy. Sadie, hun, he chided. Don't be mad. Carter has always been the boring one. I didn't really want to grant him eternal life. But you, why don't you work with me, eh? We can have tons of fun. Tearing up the universe, destroying things as we see fit. That's, that's not fair, Sadie said, her voice trembling. Tempting me with destruction. She tried for her usual sassy tone, but her eyes stayed fixed on Carter, who still wasn't moving. I knew I should do something. We'd had a plan, but I couldn't remember it. The vulture goddess in my head was flying circles on autopilot. Even Annabeth looked like she was struggling to concentrate. Being so close to Sedna was like standing next to a waterfall. His white noise drowned out everything. You know, Sedna continued, as if we were planning a party together, I think this island will be perfect. My palace will go right here, in the new center of the universe. A muddy soccer field, Annabeth noted. Oh, come now, child of Athena. You can see the possibilities. That old fool Serapis had the right idea, gather all the wisdom of Greece and Egypt together in one place, and use that power to rule the world. Except Serapis didn't have my vision. I'll consume the old pantheons, Zeus, Osiris, all those dusty deities. Who needs them? I'll just take the bits and pieces I can use from all of them. I'll become the head of a new race of gods. Humans will come here from all over the world to make offerings and buy souvenirs. Souvenirs? I said. You want immortality so you can sell t-shirts. And snow globes. Sedna got a dreamy look in his eyes. I love snow globes. Anyway, there's room for more than one new god. Sadie Kane. You'd be perfect. I know you love breaking rules. Let's break all of them. Your friends can come along too. Behind the magician, Carter groaned and began to stir. Sedna glanced back with distaste. Not dead yet.
tough kid. Well, I suppose we can include him in our plans. Although, if you'd prefer, Sadie, I can certainly finish him off. Sadie let loose a guttural cry. She advanced, but Annabeth caught her arm. Fight smart, Annabeth said. Not angry. Point taken, Sadie said, though her arm still trembled with rage. But I'll do both. She unfurled the Book of Thoth. Sedna just laughed. Sadie, dear, I know how to defeat every spell in that book. You won't win, Sadie insisted. You won't take anything else from anyone. She began to chant. Annabeth raised her borrowed kopesh, ready to defend her. Ah, well. Sedna sighed. I suppose you'll want this back, then. Sedna's body began to glow. Thanks to Nekbet, I realized what was going to happen a split second before it did, which saved our lives. Carter was just struggling to his feet when I shouted, get down. He dropped like a sack of rocks. A ring of fire exploded outward from Sedna. I discarded my sword and lunged in front of the girls, spreading my arms goalie style. A shell of purple light surrounded me, and the flames rolled harmlessly over translucent wings that now extended on either side of me. With my new accessories I was able to shield Sadie and Annabeth from the worst of the blast. I lowered my arms. The giant wings retracted. My feet, floating just off the ground, were now encased in large ghostly legs with three long toes and the talons of a bird. When I realized I was hovering at the center of a giant glowing purple vulture, my first thought was, Carter will never stop teasing me about this. My second thought was, oh, gods. Carter. Sadie must have seen him at the same time I did. She screamed. The fire had blackened the entire field, instantly turning wet mud into cracked clay. The mist and magic lights had burned away. My new sword was a steaming line of bronze slag on the ground. Carter lay right where he dropped, wreathed in smoke, his hair charred, his face red with blisters. I feared the worst. Then his fingers twitched. He croaked out a sound, like, gug, and I could breathe again. Thank the gods, Annabeth said. Setna brushed some ash off his purple trench coat. Well, you can thank the gods if you want, but they won't be around much longer. Another few minutes, and the magic I've started will be irreversible. Now, Percy, please drop that silly avatar before I take it away from you. And Sadie, I suggest you give me the Book of Thoth before you hurt yourself. There's no spell you could read that would harm me. Sadie stepped forward. Her orange highlighted hair whipped around her face. Her eyes turned steely, making her look even more like a young Annabeth. No spell I could read, Sadie agreed. But I have friends. She handed the Book of Thoth to Annabeth, who blinked in surprise. Um, Sadie. Sedna chuckled. What's she going to do? She may be smart, but she can't read Old Egyptian. Sadie gripped Annabeth's forearm. Miss Chase, she said formally, I have one word for you. She leaned in and whispered something in Annabeth's ear. Annabeth's face transformed. Only once before had I seen her with such an expression of pure wonder, when she beheld the gods' palaces on Mount Olympus. Sadie turned to me. Percy, Annabeth has work to do. I need to tend to my brother. Why don't you keep our friend Sedna entertained? Annabeth opened the scroll. She began to read aloud in ancient Egyptian. Glowing hieroglyphs floated off the papyrus. They swirled in the air around her mixing with Greek words as if Annabeth was adding her own commentary to the spell. Sedna looked even more surprised than I was. He made a strangled noise in the back of his throat. That's not, hold on, now. No. He raised his arms to cast some counterspell. His crown began to glow. I needed to move, but Nekbet wasn't helping. She was a little too focused on Carter, who smelled charbroiled and yummy. That one is weak, she murmured in my mind. Dead soon. The weak must die. Anger gave me the upper hand. Carter Kane was my friend. I would not sit around while my friend died. Move, 
I told Nekbet. And I took control of the vulture avatar. Before Sedna could finish casting his spell, I grabbed him in my spectral claws and carried him into the sky. Now, I live and breed weirdness. It goes with the territory when you're a demigod. But there are still moments when I do a mental double take, like when I'm flying upward inside a giant glowing vulture, flapping my arms to control make-believe wings, holding an almost immortal magician in my talons, all so I can steal his hat. That hat was not coming off, either. I spiraled into the storm, shaking Sedna, trying to knock the crown off his head, but the dude must have fastened it to his pompadour with superglue. He blasted me with fire and flashes of light. My bird exoskeleton deflected the attacks, but each time, the purple avatar dimmed, and my wings felt heavier. Percy Jackson. Sedna writhed in my claws. This is a waste of time. I didn't bother responding. The strain of combat was quickly taking its toll. During our first encounter, Carter had warned me that magic could literally burn up a magician if he used too much at once. I guess that applied to demigods, too. Every time Sedna blasted me or tried to wriggle out of my grip with his near-godly strength, my head throbbed. My eyesight dimmed. Soon I was drenched in sweat. I hoped Sadie was helping Carter. I hoped Annabeth was finishing whatever super weird spell she'd been chanting so we could trap Sedna, because I couldn't stay airborne much longer. We broke through the top of the cloud layer. Sedna stopped fighting, which surprised me so much, I almost dropped him. Then coldness began to seep through my vulture avatar, chilling my wet clothes, soaking into my bones. It was a subtler kind of attack, probing for weakness, and I knew I couldn't allow it. I curled my vulture feet tighter around Sedna's chest, hoping to crush him. Percy, Percy. His tone made it sound like we were a couple of bros on a night out. Don't you see what an incredible opportunity this is? A perfect do-over. You of all people should appreciate that. The Olympians once offered you their most valuable gift. They offered to make you a god, didn't they? And you, you lovable idiot, you turned them down. This is your chance to correct that mistake. My avatar flickered and blinked like a bad fluorescent tube. Neckbed, my brain buddy, turned her attention inward. You turned down immortality. Her voice was incredulous, offended. She scanned my memories. I saw my own past from her dry, cynical point of view. I stood in the throne room of Mount Olympus after the war against the Titans. Zeus offered me a reward, godhood. I turned him down flat. I wanted justice for other demigods instead. I wanted the gods to stop being jerks and to pay attention to their kids. A stupid request. A naive thing to wish for. I gave up power. You never give up power. I struggled to keep my grip on Sedna. Neckbet, those are your thoughts, not mine. I made the right choice. Then you are a fool, the vulture goddess hissed. Yeah, pal, Sedna said who apparently could hear her. I gotta agree with Neckbed on this one. You did the noble thing. How did that work out? Did the gods honor their promises? I couldn't separate Neckbed's bitterness from my own feelings. Sure, I grumbled about the gods all the time, but I'd never regretted my decision to stay mortal. I had a girlfriend. I had a family. I had my whole life ahead of me, assuming I could stay alive. Now, maybe it was just Neckbed in my mind, or Sedna toying with me, but I started to wonder if I'd made a huge blunder. I get it, kid. Sedna's voice was full of pity. The gods are your family. You want to think they're good. You want to make them proud. I wanted that with my family. My dad was Ramses the Great, you know. I was gliding in a lazy circle now, my left wing carving the tops of the storm clouds. Sedna's crown glowed more brightly. His aura grew colder, numbing my limbs and turning my thoughts sluggish. I knew I was in trouble, but I couldn't think of what to do about it. It's hard having a powerful dad, Sedna continued. Ramses was the pharaoh, of course, so most of the time he was hosting the god Horus. 
That made him distant, to say the least. I kept thinking, if I just make the right choices and prove I'm a good kid, he'll eventually notice me. He'll treat me right. But the thing is, the gods don't care about mortals, even their children. Look into the vulture's mind if you don't believe me. Behave like a good little boy, act all noble, that just makes it easier for the gods to ignore you. The only way to get their respect is to act up, be bad, and take what you want. Nekbet didn't try to convince me otherwise. She was the protector goddess of the pharaohs, but she didn't care about them as individual humans. She cared about maintaining the power of Egypt, which in turn kept the worship of the gods alive. She certainly didn't care about noble acts or fairness. Only the weak demanded fairness. The weak were carcasses waiting to die, appetizers in the long dinner of Nekbet's eternal life. You're a good kid, Setna told me. A lot nicer than the goddess you're trying to host. But you've got to see the truth. You should have taken Zeus's offer. You would be a god now. You'd be strong enough to make those changes you asked for. Strength is good, Nekbet agreed. Immortality is good. I'm giving you a second chance, Sedna said. Help me out, Percy. Become a god. We turned in the air as Nekbet's consciousness separated from mine. She'd forgotten which of us was the enemy. Nekbet favored the strong. Sedna was strong. I was weak. I remembered the way Sedna had been strip mining the duat, cutting fissures in reality, destroying the entire cosmic order to make himself immortal. I, LL just take the bits and pieces I can use, he told Sadie. My thoughts finally cleared. I understood how Sedna operated, how he'd beaten us so badly up till now. You're looking for a way into my mind, I said. Something you can relate to and use against me. But I'm not like you. I don't want immortality, especially not if it rips the world apart. Sedna smiled. Well, it was worth a try. Especially since I made you lose control of your vulture. An explosion of cold shattered my avatar. Suddenly I was falling. My one advantage. I'd been holding Sedna in my claws, which meant he was directly below me. I slammed right into him and locked my arms around his chest. We plummeted together through the clouds. I shivered so badly, I was surprised I could stay conscious. Frost caked my clothes. Wind and ice stung my eyes. I felt like I was downhill skiing without a mask. I'm not sure why Sedna didn't just magic himself away. I suppose even a powerful magician can succumb to panic. When you're free falling, you forget to think rationally, gee, I have spells and stuff. Instead your animal brain takes over and you think, oh my god this kid is holding on to me and I'm trapped and falling and I'm going to die. Even though I was seconds away from becoming vulture hors d'oeuvres, Sedna's squawking and flapping brought me some satisfaction. If we'd fallen straight down, I would have hit solid ground and died. No question. Fortunately, the winds were strong, and Governor's Island was a small target in a very big harbor. We hit the water with a wonderfully familiar ka flume. My pain disappeared. Warmth surged back into my limbs. Salt water swirled around me, filling me with new energy. Seawater always did good things for me, but normally not this fast. Maybe the presence of Nekbet ramped up my healing. Maybe my dad Poseidon was trying to do me a favor. Whatever the case, I felt great. I grabbed Sedna by the throat with one hand and began to squeeze. He fought like a demon. Believe me, I know. I've fought a few. The crown of Ptolemy glowed in the water, steaming like a volcanic vent. Sedna clawed at my arm and exhaled streams of bubbles, maybe trying to cast spells, or maybe trying to sweet talk me out of strangling him. I couldn't hear him, and I didn't want to. Underwater, I was in charge. Bring him to shore, said Nekbet's voice. Are you crazy? I thought back. This is my home court. He cannot be defeated here. Your friends are waiting. I didn't want to, but I understood. I might be able to keep Sedna occupied underwater for a while, 
but he was too far down the path to immortality for me to destroy. I needed to undo his magic, which meant I needed help. I kept my grip on his throat and let the currents push me to Governor's Island. Carter waited for me on the island's ring road. His head was wrapped in bandages like a turban. The blisters on his face had been treated with some kind of purple goo. His linen ninja jammies looked like they'd been laundered in a burning wood chipper. But he was alive, and angry. In one hand he held a glowing white rope like a cowboy's lasso. Welcome back, Percy. He glared at Sedna. This guy give you any trouble? Sedna flailed and shot fire in Carter's direction. Carter lashed the flames aside with his rope. I've got him under control for now, I said. I felt confident that was true. The seawater had brought me back to full strength. Neckbed was cooperating again, ready to shield me from anything Sedna might try. The magician himself seemed dazed and deflated. Getting strangled at the bottom of New York Harbor will do that to you. Let's go, then, Carter said. We have a nice reception planned. Back at the burned soccer fields, Sadie and Annabeth had sketched a magical bull's eye on the ground. At least that's how it looked to me. The chalk circle was about five feet in diameter, and elaborately bordered with words of power in Greek and hieroglyphics. In the duet, I could see that the circle radiated white light. It was drawn over the rift that Sedna had made, like a bandage over a wound. The girls stood on opposite sides of the circle. Sadie crossed her arms and planted her combat boots defiantly. Annabeth was still holding the Book of Thoth. When she saw me, she kept her battle face on. But from the gleam in her eyes, I could tell she was relieved. I mean, we'd just passed our one-year dating anniversary. I figured I was a sort of long-term investment for her. She hoped I would pay dividends eventually. If I died now, she would have put up with all my annoying qualities for nothing. You lived, she noted. No thanks to Elvis. I lifted Sedna by his neck. He weighed almost nothing. He was pretty tough until I figured out his system. I threw him into the center of the circle. The four of us surrounded him. The hieroglyphs in Greek letters burned and swirled, rising in a funnel cloud to contain our prisoner. Dude is a scavenger, I said. Not too different from a vulture. He picks through our minds, finds whatever he can relate to, and he uses that to get through our defenses. Annabeth's love of wisdom. Carter's desire to make his dad proud. Sadie's, my incredible modesty, Sadie guessed. And obvious good looks. Carter snorted. Anyway, I said, Sedna tried to offer me immortality. He tried to get a handle on my motives for turning it down once before, but, pardon, Sadie interrupted. Did you say you've turned down immortality before? You can still be a god. Sedna croaked. All of you. Together we can. I don't want to be a god, I said. You don't get that, do you? You couldn't find anything about me you could relate to, which I take as a big compliment. Inside my mind, Neckbed hissed kill him. Destroy him utterly. No, I said. Because that's not me, either. I stepped to the edge of the circle. Annabeth, Carter, Sadie, you ready to put this guy away? Any time. Carter hefted his rope. I crouched until I was face to face with Sedna. His coal-lined eyes were wide and unfocused. On his head, the crown of Ptolemy tilted sideways like an observatory telescope. You were right about one thing, I told him. There's a lot of power in mixing Greek and Egyptian. I'm glad you introduced me to my new friends. We're going to keep mixing it up. Percy Jackson, listen, but there's a difference between sharing and stealing, I said. You have something that belongs to me. He started to speak. I shoved my hand right in his mouth. Sound gross. Wait, it gets worse. Something guided me, maybe Neckbet's intuition, maybe my own instincts. My fingers closed around a small pointy object in the back of Sedna's throat, and I yanked it free, my ballpoint pen, riptide. It was like I'd pulled the plug out of a tire. 
magic spewed from Sedna's mouth, a multicolored stream of hieroglyphic light. Get back! Nekbet screamed in my mind as Annabeth yelled the same thing aloud. I stumbled away from the circle. Sedna writhed and spun as all the magic he tried to absorb now came gushing out in a disgusting torrent. I'd heard about people, puking rainbows, because they saw something that was just too cute. Let me tell you, if you actually see someone puking rainbows, there's nothing cute about it. Annabeth and Sadie shouted magic commands in unison. The funnel cloud of magic intensified around the circle, hemming in Sedna, who was shriveling rapidly. The crown of Ptolemy rolled off his head. Carter stepped forward and threw his glowing rope. As soon as the rope touched Sedna, a flash of light blinded me. When my vision returned, Sedna and the rope were gone. No magic lights swirled. The vulture goddess had left my mind. My mouth no longer tasted like dead hyena. Annabeth, the canes, and I stood in a loose ring, staring at the crown of Ptolemy, which lay sideways in the dirt. Next to it sat a plastic bauble the size of a goose egg. I picked it up. Inside the snow globe, a miniature model of Governor's Island was permanently submerged. Alternately running and swimming around the landscape, trying to avoid flurries of fake snow, was a termite-sized man in a purple trench coat. Sedna had made Governor's Island his eternal headquarters, after all. He'd been imprisoned in a cheap plastic souvenir. An hour later, we sat on the parapets of the old fort, watching the sun go down over the New Jersey coastline. I'd had a cheese sandwich and an ice-cold Rabina from Sadie's extra-dimensional stash of junk food, along with two extra-strength Advil, so I was feeling brave enough to hear explanations. Would someone explain what happened back there? I asked. Annabeth slipped her hand into mine. We won, seaweed brain. Yeah, but, I gestured at the snow globe, which Carter was now admiring. How? Carter shook the globe. Fake snow swirled inside. Maybe it was my imagination, but I swear I could hear Sedna shrieking underwater as he was given the blender tour of his tiny prison. I guess the snow globe idea got stuck in my head, Carter said. When I threw the rope and sprung the trap, the magic conformed to what I was thinking. Anyway, Sedna will make a great paperweight. Sadie snorted, almost nostril spewing her rabina. Poor little Sedna stuck on Carter's desk for eternity, forced to watch him do hours and hours of boring research. It would have been kinder to let Amit devour his soul. I didn't know who Amit was, but I didn't need any more soul-devouring monsters in my life. So the trap worked, I said, which I guess was kind of obvious. I don't need to understand all the details, that's good, Annabeth said. Since I don't think any of us do. But one thing I've gotta know. I pointed at Sadie. What did you whisper to Annabeth that turned her into a magician? The girls exchanged a smile. I told Annabeth my secret name, Sadie said. You're what, now? I asked. It's called the Wren, Sadie explained. Everyone has one, even if you don't know it. The Wren is, well, the definition of who you are. Once I shared it, Annabeth had access to my experiences, my abilities, all my general amazingness. That was risky. Carter gave me a grim look. Anyone who knows your Ren can control you. You never share that information unless you really have to, and only with people you absolutely trust. Sadie found out my secret name last year. My life has sucked ever since. Oh, please, Sadie said. I only use my knowledge for good. Carter suddenly slapped himself in the face. Hey. He complained. Oops. Sorry, Sadie said. At any rate, I do trust Annabeth. I knew it would take both of us to create that containment circle. Besides, a Greek demigod casting Egyptian magic, did you see the look on Sedna's face? Priceless. My mouth went dry. I imagined Annabeth invoking hieroglyphs at Camp Half-Blood, blowing up chariots on the racetrack, hurling giant blue fists during Capture the Flag. So my girlfriend is a magician now, like, permanently. 
because she was scary enough before. Annabeth laughed. Don't worry, seaweed brain. The effect of learning Sadie's Wren is already wearing off. I'll never be able to do any magic on my own. I breathe a sigh of relief. Okay. So, um, last question. I nodded to the crown of Ptolemy, which sat on the parapet next to Sadie. It looked like part of a Halloween costume, not the sort of headgear that could violently rip the world apart. What do we do with that? Well, Sadie said, I could put it on and see what happens. No. Carter and Annabeth yelled. Kidding, Sadie said. Honestly, you two, calm down. I must admit, though, I don't see why Wadjet and Nekbet didn't reclaim their crowns. The goddesses were freed, weren't they? Yeah, I said. I sensed that Cobra Lady Wadjet get expelled when Setna was puking rainbows. Then Nekbet went back to, wherever goddesses go when they're not annoying mortals. Carter scratched his bandaged head. So, they just forgot their crowns. Traces of Nekbet's personality lingered in the corners of my mind, just enough to make me uncomfortably sure that the crown of Ptolemy had been left here on purpose. It's a test, I said. The two ladies want to see what we'll do with it. When Nekbet learned that I'd turned down immortality once before, she was kind of offended. I think she's curious to find out if any of us will go for it. Annabeth blinked. Nekbet would do that out of curiosity. Even if it caused a world-destroying event. Sounds like Nekbet, Sadie said. She's a malicious old bird loves to watch us mortals squabble and kill each other. Carter stared at the crown. But, we know better than to use that thing. Don't we? His voice sounded a little wistful. For once you're right, brother, dear, Sadie said. As much as I'd love to be a literal goddess, I suppose I'll have to remain a figurative one. I'm going to puke rainbows now, Carter said. So what do we do with the crown? Annabeth asked. It's not the kind of thing we should leave at the governor's island lost and found. Hey, Carter, I said, after we defeated that crocodile monster on Long Island, you said you had a safe place to keep its necklace. Could you store the crown, too? The Canes had a silent conversation with each other. I suppose we could bring the crown to the first gnome in Egypt, Carter said. Our Uncle Amos is in charge there. He has the most secure magic vaults in the world. But nothing is 100% safe. Setna's experiments with Greek and Egyptian magic sent tremors through the duet. Gods and magicians felt them. I'm sure demigods felt them, too. That kind of power is tempting. Even if we lock the crown of Ptolemy away, others might try hybrid magic, Annabeth said. And the more it's tried, Sadie said, the more damage could be done to the duet, and the mortal world, and our sanity. We sat in silence as that idea sank in. I imagined what would happen if the kids in the Hecate cabin back at camp heard about Egyptian magicians in Brooklyn, or if Clarice from the Ares cabin learned how to summon a giant wild boar combat avatar. I shuddered. We'll have to keep our world separate as much as possible. The info is too dangerous. Annabeth nodded. You're right. I don't like keeping secrets, but we'll have to be careful who we talk to. Maybe we can tell Chiron, but, I bet Chiron already knows about the Egyptians, I said. He's a wily old centaur. But, yeah. We'll have to keep our little task force here on the down low. Our little task force. Carter grinned. I like the sound of that. The four of us can keep in touch. We'll have to stand ready in case something like this happens again. Annabeth has my number, Sadie said. Which, honestly, brother, is a much easier solution than writing invisible hieroglyphs on your friend's hand. What were you thinking? It made sense at the time, Carter protested. We cleaned up our picnic stuff and got ready to go our separate ways. Carter carefully wrapped the crown of Ptolemy in linen cloth. Sadie gave the governor's island snow globe a good shake, then stuffed it in her pack. The girls hugged. I shook Carter's hand. With a twinge of pain, 
I realized how much I was going to miss these kids. I was getting tired of making new friends only to tell them goodbye, especially since some of them never came back. Take care of yourself, Carter, I said. No more getting roasted in explosions. He smirked. I can't promise. But call us if you need us, okay? And, uh, thanks. Hey, it was a team effort. I guess. But, Percy, it came down to you being a good person. Setna couldn't get a handle on you. Honestly, if I'd been tempted with godhood the way you were tempted, you would have done the same thing, I said. Maybe. He smiled, but he didn't look convinced. Okay, Sadie. Time to fly. The initiates at Brooklyn House are going to be worried. And Khufu is making jello fruit salad for dinner, she said. Should be delicious. Toodle oo, demigods. The canes turned into birds of prey and launched themselves into the sunset. This has been a weird day, I told Annabeth. She slipped her hand into mine. I'm thinking cheeseburgers for dinner at P. J. Clark's. With bacon, I said. We've earned it. I love the way you think, she said. And I'm glad you're not a god. She kissed me, and I decided that I was glad too. A kiss in the sunset and the promise of a good bacon cheeseburger, with that kind of payoff, who needs immortality.